are headed to Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. And so they're going to be a part of a crusade, and it's a church that we go to there, and they do a crusade every year, every other year, and uh, Pastor Ted and Kelly are going. They're going to A, participate, B, watch, C, be exposed to things that they've never seen before, and get exposed to anointings and the, the, the power of God that, uh, that just is inspiring, honestly. Uh, last time, I, the only time I went was, I think, back in 99. Um, and um, just as a short, a short little blurb here, and I, I, I take my liberty here for Pastor, is that uh, when many years ago, many, many years ago, uh, before Pastor started doing any mission trip, there's a prophetic man who came through the church. And part of that prophetic word that he prayed over Pastor in the church is he said, in the not too distant future, you're going to go overseas and say, see the works of the apostle and the signs, wonders, and miracles, and you'll say to yourself, if they can do it here, we can do it in Claremore. And at that time, he thought it was Philippines, or he thought it was Mexico, or he thought it was all these connections that, that we thought that they were going to use. And then, long story short, he got connected with a, a gentleman, a, a, a man, a blast from the past. You guys have some of those blasts from the past that sometimes you wish wouldn't contact you? That's kind of how this was, except this man had a, had a Jesus encounter. And uh, told Pastor, long story short, Pastor went, went over with them to Africa and got the prophetic word was fulfilled. Saw the works of the apostles, signs, wonders, miracles. Hey, if we can do it there, if they can do it there, we can do it here. And so part of the grace and anointing that he's going to be exposed to, participated in, while they are gone, we want to be praying for them. A, we want them to bring it back. B, we know that there's no distance with God, right? Same spirit of God that dwells in the believers over there dwells in us. And so we want to be believing with great expectation that we partake of that same grace here and that you can flow in that same grace here where you work, where you live, where you move, where you have your being. Amen? So we're going to pray for them and send them off. Uh, right now, kiddos, we normally pray for you and bless you. Come on up here. We're going to do something a little different, something a little special. Come on, you young men and women of God. Come on, get on up here. Gather around Pastor and Kelly. You guys are going to pray for him. Now, you guys have been exposed, right? You guys see, see Pastor Ms. and the leadership. We pray for you guys every week, and we bless you, right? I want you to do the same thing. Gather around. Put your hands on their shoulders or on their head, on their back. Put your hand on them. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to pray, and I want you guys just to say, Pastor Ted, we bless you. Pastor Ted, we send you out in the name of Jesus. All right, why don't you guys just pray that? One, two, three. Pastor Ted, we bless you. Pastor Ted and Kelly, we send you out in the name of Jesus. And Father in heaven, we declare your goodness and your grace over Kelly and over Pastor Ted. Lord, we declare that your signs and wonders and your miracles will go forth before them. Lord, we thank you for a safe and wonderful trip. Lord, we thank you for no hitches in the airports, no hitches in the airplanes, no hitches in the travel, Lord. And that when they get there, they will be well rested and well received, Lord. And that it will be a life transformation encounter with your presence. In a life transformation encounter, Lord, with, with the glory that you're pouring out in West Africa. And the Lord, we thank you that that glory is here as well. And Lord, we thank you that as they go and they bring it back, Lord, that we will walk in it. We can partake of it as well. Now, do any of you guys, any of you guys, I mean, same spirit of God that lives in you, lives in us. So are you hearing anything from the Lord? Do any of you guys want to pray something out loud? You just pray it nice and loud so I can hear. Anybody? Do I need to call a name? No? All right. Everybody, one, two, three, amen. One, two, three, amen. Thank you, guys. No. All right. Now, you guys, yes, you guys go to Children's Church. Be blessed. Yeah, you guys You guys go, go down to Children's Ministry. Be blessed. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Hallelujah. Thank you, children and adults. And uh, just so you know, I'm scheduled to preach next Friday afternoon in Crusade. And that will be uh, 
around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, which is 5 hours from 2 is whatever it is here. You guys, we're about 5 hours ahead of you when we're there. And so uh, be aware of that. Now, are you only going to preach once, Pastor? I never know what I'm going to do. I know I'm scheduled once. Amen. Hey, it's good to see everybody. A couple of things. First of all, I want to say thank you for receiving Peter and Evie back last week in such a wonderful fashion. You guys blessed them so much. It was an extraordinary offering that was given. And uh, I'm trying to remember what in excess of, what was it? Almost $6,000. Praise God. And so it was really a, a blessing to them and a help, help to them. And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And then be able to have the picnic. Peter expressed to me on more than one occasion how grateful he was to have that time out at Jim and Connie's and to be able to individually talk to people and have some time like that. And so uh, for those of you that made it out to the picnic, thank you. And uh, it was just terrific. And uh, I really love those guys. They're special. And they're living out the uh, uh, sacrificial life of service for the king. And uh, what a blessing to be in relationship with them, to know them, to be able to invest in their ministry as they're advancing the kingdom of God in indigenous tribes who have never in generations ever heard the gospel. You can go 45 minutes from their home in one direction and there's a community that has never heard the gospel. That's remarkable, isn't it, when you think about it. In our world, with the technology, with all the stuff that goes on, to think that you could be less than an hour away from a village who had never, one, seen a white man, and two, heard the gospel message. Isn't that something? It's amazing. And so, uh, thank you. Thank you for the grace you extended to them and for your generous offering to help them in their journey. I appreciate it. You know, the Lord made promises about things like that. You probably ought to look them up in the scripture and read them sometime. But he really made promises about investing in people and helping them on their way to take the gospel. And so I, I just like to say, Lord, I receive your promise. You know, we don't give to get. But friends, when you're generous, God sees it. He really does. It matters in, it matters in heaven. Amen. Secondly, uh, there was a message in tongues and an interpretation of tongues that's fascinating to me about uh, pursuing God and, and, and searching after God. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. It's very much in harmony with the word the message that I have from the Word of God today uh, in the book of James. And so, uh, thank you. I believe it was Chad that did that. Thank you, Chad, for letting the Holy Spirit use you today in this service. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, it's good. Now, uh, David is going to be ministering the word tonight and leading the evening service. And so uh, I appreciate that. Uh, my wife, in her wisdom, suggested to me yesterday, honey, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. Honey, why don't you not be responsible for church on Sunday night since you're leaving for Africa on Monday morning? And not have the pressure of that. And so David graciously agreed to lead that service tonight. And uh, if I'm packed and everything's in order, I'll be here. Uh, if not, I'll see you guys when I get back. Next Sunday, Pastor Travis will be bringing the word. And uh, he'll be in the book of James as well. We're going to continue, hopefully by the end of August, finish the, the epistle of James. Uh, it's my goal. And... Uh, Hadn't this been a great study? This has been a great study. Let me welcome those of you that are uh, tuning in on Facebook Live this morning. Uh, thank you for watching uh, Life Changer uh, feed. Uh, we trust you'll be blessed by the Word of God. And, uh, you know, if you want to participate in the giving and receiving of God's grace around here, you certainly can send in an offering. If you go to our webpage, lifechangerchurch.com, you, um, you can make a contribution there. It's very simple. There's a donate tab. And uh, just click it and follow the instructions. We would graciously receive your gift. Thank you. 
And you know, last fall, we received an invitation to go on uh, TV that covers the footprint of Africa and the islands of Africa. So it would be Madagascar, any of the various islands around the continent there. And we received an invitation to do that. And that's when we invested in the cameras and the technology and the production studio back there and the guys that are running that this morning uh, to do that so we could participate on that TV channel. Uh, the church I'm going to, they were given a 24-7 uh, channel on a satellite and, uh, and have invited us to participate. And so that's why we bought the technology. We've been working really hard to try to learn how to use it and make a, a quality production. And so I'm taking some of those productions on a memory stick uh, for them to view and observe. And very likely, within, within a matter of uh, weeks, we will be on that TV channel covering the, the continent footprint of the continent of Africa and the islands. And so, uh, which is very miraculous in that we really didn't do any, hadn't do, weren't doing any of these things. Uh, and then when we did, it was a $10,000 investment. And honestly... The equipment and the technology and stuff was paid for uh, and never uh, def never put a dent in our general income and the stuff we need to pay the electric bill and things, you know. And so we appreciate that and uh, the generosity that's been shown. Now, amen. I believe that's all the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, would uh, some of you guys make sure that you tell my wife that you're available to help her in my absence? Before you leave here today. You know. I, I want you to know. That you just need to assume. If I'm out of town. Uh, she may need a hero. You say well David could take care of it. David's going back to Florida this week. So I just expect some of the men around here. To step up and communicate to my wife. That if she needs something. She's free to call you. You know. She needs help. That of a manly nature. She's free to call you, okay? Uh, so I said, well, you should just assume that, Pastor. I assume nothing. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you uh, inspired James to write this amazing epistle. Lord, that you have put your imprinter on and your stamp of approval, and it is an inspired, inerrant, infallible word from heaven for us. Thank you so much for the word of God. Because we know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Lord, may we consume your word today. May it be spiritual. May it be life-giving. May it be sustenance for our soul. May it be all that you have promised it to be. May we have a hearing ear for me to be able to speak as an oracle of God. And for those who are listening to be able to hear with clarity and clear application, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in James chapter 4, and so what I want to do first of all is I just want to pass and review a little bit. Uh, now, who is this James? This is James, the brother of Jesus. This is not James, the apostle. He was martyred early on in the life of the church. This is James the brother of Jesus, who became a follower of Jesus after the resurrection. Okay, and he's written this epistle. And uh, who is it written to? Jewish believers who were scattered from Jerusalem because of the Roman persecution. These are Jewish believers that were scattered across the face of the world, that known part of the world at that time. And so he's writing them a letter. And so there's a lot of Jewish ideas and concepts and thoughts that are contained in this epistle. And, uh, and it's very fascinating to me, in James 1 and 2, the kinds of content that are covered. At the end of chapter 2, for instance, he begins to talk about faith without works is dead. Dead works. You know, I mean, if we claim to have faith, it should produce action in our lives. It should produce activity in our lives. It should produce... God activity in our lives when we claim to have faith, both personally for us in our families and in the larger spectrum of where we live and move and have our beings, such as our work, our community interaction, our shopping uh, techniques, you know, 
You know, if you're a real Christian, you can hold yourself together at Walmart. When it's not going your way. Real Christians look different in worldly context. There may, in my, my mind, there may be some question to the legitimacy of your Christianity if you behave just like the world when you get in a tough place. This will get better as we go along. You know, I'm not saying you're not born again, but I'm saying you might be a baby. You might be immature in the things of God. We all start there, you know. We all start there. You know, we, we get born again. We're, we're a child of God, and quite literally, we're a baby in Christ. That's why it's really important to be in the church where you can be nurtured and strengthened, guided and helped and encouraged and corrected. You can make adjustments, and that you learn that when you're not acting like a Christian, you repent, so you can start acting like a Christian again. Christians behave a certain way. Christians emote a certain way. Christians speak with a certain tongue. Whether you're under pressure or not, there is no excuse to act like a sinner. Somebody said, thank God he's leaving the country tomorrow. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in chapter 3, the first part of chapter 3, he talks about the tongue and the words that we speak and, and how powerful they can be. But at the end of chapter 3, he really draws this contrast between wisdom that comes from God and wisdom that comes not from God. And really worldly wisdom, are, and he, said, he calls it demonic. Because uh, wisdom that's not from God is inspired. Say, how can it be wisdom not from God? It's not really wisdom. It's not godly wisdom. You may be shrewd and smart in a worldly way, but it may not be God's way. You know, there's a wisdom from God that, first of all, is peaceful. And there's a wisdom from hell uh, that starts with envy and self-seeking and confusion. And every evil thing is there. That doesn't sound like wisdom to me. Well, but I'm seeking godly wisdom. Aren't you? I mean, I, I want the wisdom of God. I want the wisdom of God to apply to my life and in the choices I make. And then we got into chapter 4, and we talked about one of the famous verses here is, uh, you know, uh, you, you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss. And we talked about how in context, this is basically God saying, look, you're asking for the wrong stuff. You know you're asking for the wrong stuff. And that's why you're not getting any answers. Why do you keep asking for the wrong thing? Because you know better. And, you know, and um, that's funny. In verse 6, he, uh, I guess it's verse 4, he says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Now, I'm, I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, wh whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, that, that, that is a hard saying. That is a hard saying. Calls us adulterers and adulteresses. Now remember this crowd that he's written this letter to. These are people who are struggling with the Jewish structures and the Jewish worship expressions and their newfound faith. They have faith where they are saved by grace and through the mercy of God. And yet they're struggling with this tension. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to suggest to you this morning that most of us still struggle with this tension. We're not Jewish struggling with the expressions of the Jewish law, but we are religious. Many of us in this room were raised in religious uh, systems. We have names for it. We might call it a Baptist. We might call it a Methodist. We might call it a you know, Seventh-day Adventist. We might call it whatever we call it. But we're raised with a certain set of lenses put on us and expectations put on us. And so we're raised that way. Now, uh, if you're like my wife, she had a grandfather that was a wonderful, godly man, but she was raised uh, out of church. And so when she got saved and she came to meet Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, she really didn't have a lot of religious history and background. And she was in much better shape than me. 
And so, and so this idea of being worldly, loving the world, when we are worldly, we make ourselves to be an enemy of God. For God is not worldly, he is heavenly. God has a way to walk in, and it's not the world's way, and it is not man's way. It's God's way. Jesus illustrates it in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, turn the other cheek. The guy hits you. Or he says, if he asks the Roman, asks you to go a mile, you go two miles. Or if he asks you for your cloak, you give him your coat also. God's way is extraordinary, above and beyond the ordinary. Through expressions of mercy and kindness. God's way is different. Say it with me. God's way is a different way. Now, how many of you remember that Jesus said that narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting and broad is the way that leads to destruction? Y'all remember that? These are the words of Jesus. They're in the red in the book. And, uh, and, and, and people say to me, some, Pastor, you're just so narrow-minded. Well, narrow is, the way, <coughs> excuse me, narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. You know, Jesus was narrow-minded. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I am the shepherd at the gate of the sheepfold, and if you want to come into the sheepfold, you come through me. Jesus was narrow-minded. Now, narrow-minded and legalist are two different things. God's way is narrow, but God's way is not hard. Now, your flesh may scream. Your carnal desires may kick and holler all the way to the grave. The truth of the matter is we have to die to self. And we have to die. That's, Jesus invites us to die to ourselves so that we can possess and embrace the life of God. Am I over y'all's head? So here we go. So he talks about the tongue. He talks about the two wisdoms. He talks about the power of pride. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, like, I'm really proud of my sons. But that's a pride that's not sin. So, so it's not just a blanket statement about pride. But it's a pride that exalts itself against God. Verse 5 says, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. God gives us more grace. So then the Bible says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What is humility? What is humble? Humility is being teachable. Just in simple terms, if you want to take a position of humility, you do not bow your back and resist new information. You do not get more stubborn. You become teachable. You become pliable. You become clay in the potter's hands. You let him mold you and shape you in your thinking. I had an experience yet. Uh, when was this? Friday. Uh, David and I, Melissa, and Kevin, we, uh, we attended the Global Leadership Summit in downtown Tulsa. And it's really terrific. It's just a wonderful thing for us as leaders to do. And be good for anybody, really. But it's a global leadership summit. And um, Pastor Craig Rochelle of Life Church uh, preached the final message. And uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've had this experience a few times in my life. And I had it again Friday afternoon. I had a paradigm shift. Now, y'all know a paradigm is not two dimes, right? A way of thinking. A way of viewing life. Could call it a worldview shift. I'm not sure it was as big as a worldview. First time I went to Africa was, was an earthquake on my worldview. It changed me forever. But a paradigm shift, meaning a way of structure, a way of looking at things. And this man preached the message, and the Holy Spirit did that thing that only he can do. 
He took mere men's words and he did something inside my soul. I could feel it happening as I was listening to him. And, and I'm a guy, now I don't know about you, but I'm a guy that can't unsee something. It's like once I get it, once I get it, I can't unget it. Once truth is revealed to me, I can't pretend it's not true anymore. Now, I know Christians who do that. Bless their hearts, uh, you know, and, and their, their foolishness. But I'm not one of those guys. When I really get it and I understand it's God, and I had that happen. And, and I, don't even, I, I don't even know how to apply what he was speaking to my heart. And so I'm not trying to do it this morning. But you're going to see a change in the way I preach. Because I got a revelation. I got an insight. I had a paradigm shift. And it so shifted me that it's messed with me. If you ever have a change in thinking so that it impacts the way you think, it impacts the way you believe, it impacts the way you function, it impacts all kinds of different things in your life, and it actually goes to places you never imagined it would go. And that happened to me. That's humility. Why am I telling you that story? Because that's an illustration, not to brag on me, but, but I try to stay teachable. I want to hear what the Spirit's saying. I don't want to be an enmity, which is a fancy King Jamesy word that means enemy thereof. I don't want to be an enemy of God. I want to be a friend of God. I want to be a person that walks in close association with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the desire of my heart. That's the desire of my heart. So let's look at these last few verses. Of course, one of my favorite things is, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And when I was preparing this, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to re-emphasize this. Listen, don't go around resisting devil when you're living in disobedience. Somebody looked at somebody and said, ah, that's Pastor Ted. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we, we get wacko about this stuff. We don't understand. It, and we just don't understand. You can't go around binding and loosing and rebuking and doing stuff with the devil when you personally are living out of submission to God. It won't work. What happens is you draw attention and more demons show up. And now instead of doing one little old empty pain in the tush devil, you got a whole herd of them because they're pack animals. And if you start giving them attention, they'll show up. So I'm all about deliverance. I'm all about being free. But so many people want to be free without surrender. So many people, this is for somebody. This is a life-changing, life-giving word for somebody in here this morning. I know it is. You're going to have the same experience I had on Friday. This is going to shift your paradigm. Because you're, it's, you're going to hear it for, through the power of the Holy Spirit in a way you've never heard it before. Listen. Spiritual warfare is not something you take lightly or silly. But it's real. God wants you to be free. Jesus died for you to be free. But the process of freedom is submit to God, resist the devil, he'll flee. It's not resist the devil and get around to submitting to God. No, no, no. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. And by the way, I'm so happy to have had Tommy Jean and Ishmael with us today helping us in worship. What a blessing. I surrender. I may want to do I surrender, some kind of surrender song at the end. I don't know. So, <clears throat> let me get to today's lesson. Verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges the brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you, will be not, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Remember, who's he writing to? A bunch of Jews that know the law. They're appealing to the rules. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Uh, who are you to judge? Who are you to judge one another? Do not judge your brother. And he says, Who are you to judge another? 
Five, guys, listen, we're not people who are designed to judge people. Jesus, and I think it's Matthew 7, says, do not judge lest you be judged. And then in verse 2 of that same chapter, he says, in the way that you judge, you will be judged. Now, what I find is that I really want mercy when I've messed up, but I want law when you don't keep the rules. And you're just like me. You want mercy when you fail or you mess up. Oh, I want mercy. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. But boy, when I look at somebody else who's not doing very well, I can easily drift into judgment. Jesus went on in, John, in Matthew 7 and said, look, uh, yeah, for, before you go judging people, get the telephone pole out of your eye before you try to mess with specks in other people's eyes. That's a word picture, isn't it? You know, and uh, some of the most judgmental people, I got this image. When somebody's judging somebody, I just, somehow I see them with a, a you know, a four by four sticking out of their head. <laughs> Don't pick on my specks when you got a two by four in your eye. The guys, the truth of the matter is we're all going to make judgments about people. We're all going to make judgments about life. The point is, Make sure you guard your heart so that the spirit that you're making your decisions is a spirit of mercy and love and kindness in Christ. Matter of fact, Pastor David runs around here saying this all the time. He said, you need to give people the benefit of the doubt, assuming the best about them. Instead of thinking, well, they're just out to get me or they're just out to control, manipulate, whatever it is. Give people the benefit of the doubt. A sign of maturity is when we can give people the benefit of the doubt and assume the best about them. Assume they made a mistake, not that they were malicious. Assume that their heart was in the right place. Assume their heart was, they just messed up. They just made a mistake. Have you ever made a mistake? Is there a witness in the house? Have you ever just made a mistake and you had the best of intentions, but you went stupid for a moment? You know, or you went and you went and made the wrong decision and you hurt somebody or you disappointed somebody or you, you may have done worse. But you didn't intend to do that. You just messed up. Your immaturity showed up. Your hot-headedness showed up. Your jumping to conclusions without facts showed up. Yeah, your, your telephone pole got in the way. You know? Benefit of the doubt. Verse 12, it says, uh, There's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? I know we make judgments. So let's just make sure we're tempered with mercy. God doesn't want us to be naive or simple-minded and have people taking advantage of us. But he does want us to make sure then when we have to take a stand, we take it in mercy. We take it in kindness. Amen, Pastor Ted. Always think the best. Say it with me. Always think the best. Now listen to this. Come on now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend the year there, buy, sell, and trade, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall believe and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. Now, I'm going to close with this passage right here. Look at this. You know what this is about? Tomorrow may never come. Boasting in self is dangerous. If you're a note taker, you could write that down or type that in your phone. Boasting in self. What I'm going to do. Where I'm going to go. That kind of boasting, the Bible says, is evil. I think I'm saying it's dangerous. 
Dependence upon God is essential. I learned this with my children. You know, one of the great qualifications God put on pastoring is that you had to, uh, you had to learn how to live like Jesus with your kids before you're qualified to live like Jesus with adults. It's just an interesting process. I learned it with my kids. I learned to not make promises I couldn't keep. No matter how well intended I was, say, you know, guys, if it works out, we'll do this. Say, well, you're hedging your bets. No, I've read the Bible. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. That's going to show up in chapter 5, by the way. James is very practical. Dependence upon God is essential. The Lord willing, I'm planning on, you know, the Lord willing, I'm getting on an airplane tomorrow, and Kelly's getting on a different airplane, by the way. He's going to Europe, and I'm going to Africa, and I'll see him on Tuesday. We'll meet up together Tuesday afternoon. The Lord willing. The Lord willing. Are you listening to me? The Lord willing. The Lord willing, Pastor David's going to preach and lead the service tonight. There is a, an element where we understand that our life is but a vapor and that we are here to serve God in the time we have. And whether that's teaching a classroom, whether that's uh, organizing Pepsi, whatever that may be, whatever our role in life is, we do that at the pleasure of the Lord. Homemaker, pleasure of the Lord. Homeschool mom, pleasure of the Lord. The idea is not to become arrogant about what I'm going to do. Where I'm going to go. That big eye thing would get you in trouble. The Lord willing, I'm going to do it. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in, er in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Listen to those words. When I'm boasting about me and mine and I and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this other thing. No, that's evil. Because you have left God out. You have excluded the Lord. We never want to exclude the Lord. We never want to exclude the Lord. And in verse 17, just real quick here, it said, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I have known this verse all my life. I've heard this verse quoted and applied in all kinds of places. But do you know what he's talking about here? He's talking about knowing better than to be arrogant and self uh, 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 driven, eye driven. If you, you know, and if you know better than to do that, and you still go there, it's sin for you. Boy, context is important in the book of James. What is James talking about? He talks about this. If you know what to do and you don't do it, it's sin to you. He's talking about your boasting. He's talking about your judging. He's talking about you're trying to resist the devil without submitting to God. He's talking about demonic wisdom versus godly wisdom. And it comes to a climax or to a head when he says, listen, when you know what to do and you choose not to do it, it's sin for you. You know what? It doesn't mean it's sin for everybody. How many of you got things you can't do or that other people do that you can't do because if you do them, you know it'd be sin for you. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Now there are some things that are sin for everybody. Lying, stealing, sexual sin. Those things are plain. But there's things in life that where I have vulnerabilities and you don't have those vulnerabilities, I can't go. I can't do. I can't participate. It would be sin for me. It's not the wisdom of God. But you're okay with it. You know, the Bible teaches that drunkenness is a bad deal. Right? But honestly, the Scripture does not teach teetotalers. When Jesus turned the water into wine, it wasn't grape juice. 
It started out water. It became wine. So I'm not the guy who's going to stand here and condemn you if you have a glass of wine with something, but I'm not going to. You invite me to your house and you pour out booze, I'm not partaking. Now you get drunk, I'm going to kick you all over the field. <laughs> Which means you have no fruit of self-control going on. So I'm not an advocate of drinking. I'm not an advocate of beer. I'm not an advocate of wine. But I'm not your judge until you get drunk. And bless God, I'm your pastor then. And my job description is to draw some boundaries on that. And excess is everything, not just in booze, you guys. Excess is also about eating. Oh, why did he go there? Yeah, we just love to preach about other people's sin, see? How about excess binge TV watching? Could that, could that be excess? Could that be a place you know better than to go, but you go there anyway? When was the last time you watched all the episodes of Downton Abbey in three days? Oh, uh, guys, I love the Word of God. I love the Holy Spirit. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit work together in such a wonderful way. Next week, Travis is going to be talking to you about, this, about rich people oppressing the poor, about some other things in Chapter 5 if you want to read ahead. You can read ahead in the book. And listen to me. To him that knoweth to do good. And do it not. It's sin. For you. Did you see that? Did you see that? To him, it is sin. And it's not my job to judge your sin. Until you become dangerous. Then as pastor, I get that's a different role. Amy, I have a word for you. I uh, came during worship. The Lord said that he's very pleased with your growth process. I thought, is that, that doesn't seem like a significant word, but I heard it very clearly. The Lord is pleased with your spiritual formation growth process, you know, which I know and you know doesn't mean you've arrived, but it's like, it's like heaven is saying, well done. And so I bless you with that word today bless you with that word today. I bless you with that word today. Hallelujah. The Lord is pleased. And I think you beat yourself up a lot because you're not, it doesn't seem like you're making progress enough, fast enough, all the enough words. But uh, you need to take a deep breath and just relax. You're on his growth thing and it's, it's okay. Okay. I was putting a chart on the wall or something, you know. You're making progress, and that's what God expects. And I think to all of us who've known you these years, you and Gary have been with us, it's we can see it. Now, you're bold and outspoken, and so we see it when you're not there, too. But the Lord says he's pleased with the progress. 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 So, so it's almost I want to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Knowing you haven't arrived, but knowing that it's, it's, it's good progress. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I love you, church. I love you. I want the best for you. I can tell you I am not perfect. Don't you dare put me on a pedestal. Because if you get my get me all inflated thinking I'm special, God knows how to let the air out of the balloon. Let me tell you, he really does. Uh, but I love you, and I want the best for you. And I know that if you will submit to God, you absolutely can resist the devil and limit his access and ability to torment your life. But if you get that cart, that horse in front of that cart, and you go out trying to do all this resistance stuff, but you haven't yielded to God, surrendered, you just hurt yourself. 
you're going to hurt God. And you can hinder the operation of the kingdom, but you're not going to hurt God, but you'll hurt yourself. See, see, if we get arrogant about this stuff, it's not safe. No, we stay teachable. We embrace mercy. I want justice. No, you don't. You want mercy. You know why? Because we need mercy. Sometimes life's not fair. Bad things happen to good people. It's not, it, and it's just, and, and sometimes you don't have explanations for those things. You can't figure it out so it satisfies your brain, your reasonings. I want you to know God loves you, church. God loves you. You can know that Pastor Ted loves you too. I do. And I care enough to confront. I don't like it. Amen. Let's stand together, church. Hey, if you're a guest,